tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Oh, howdy there, friend. Welcome back to Casa de Blood, where the heat bills are zero, the swamp gas is free, and if you don't mind shooting it yourself, all the food you can eat. It's paradise when you think about it. Yes, Chester, and friendly alligators. And no, you can't come inside. Shoes and shirts required. No class, that feller. Come on in, friend. Hmm. All right. So tonight, we've got a good one from returning author Curtis M. Lawson. A story from his brand new collection, The Envious Nothing, a collection of literary ruin. Well, that shit ain't easy to say. I guess it's a good thing you're gonna read it. Go on, try it. A collection of literary ruin. Ru uh, literary ruin. God damn. <sighs> what is it with authors and these damn impossible things to pronounce? I got Harville knocking me around twice with his beastesses. This is, or whatever the hell it is. Now old Lawson's trying to take me down. Will somebody please tell me what the hell I did? I promise it was not intentional, whatever it was, but I'm sorry. All right, moving along. Curtis's new collection is called The Envious Nothing, a collection of literary ruin. <laughs> it's what the kids like to call a banger. Now, the way I understand it, that can mean anything from a good song to an English sausage to your ex-girlfriend. So let me clarify, it's a book. All right, friends, smoke them if you got them and drink those glasses to the bottom, because your buddy Drew Blood has a tale to tell. But first, the rigmarole. Hey, you guys patrons yet? Visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click patrons in the upper menu and join the club. You get ad-free versions of this and all our other podcasts, including hundreds of standalone releases from our audio archives dating back to 2012. It's a great way to show your support and get a whole lot for it. And submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to hear on the show, you can send them directly to us at drewbloodhover at gmail.com. Y'all know my style by now, friends. I trust your judgment. Let's get to work. Tonight we join Ian, a punk rocker on his way to a gig. And since it's a Curtis Lawson story, I'm sure nothing unusual will happen, and everyone will get home safe afterward. That's just how he rolls, you know? So without further ado, I give you... Orphan. Ian sat at the red light on the corner of Ripley and Walton. The night was silent save for the music on the stereo and the sounds of night birds. Street lights bathed the empty city with sodium radiance. He scanned the rows of tightly packed houses on either side of the street for any sign of life. The stoops and porches were vacant despite the pleasant springtime weather and no light shined from any of the windows. While Ian had never been to Ironwood, Minnesota before, he knew its story just the same. He'd seen places like this in his travels, parts of Flint and Detroit, the old town of Thurman in West Virginia, towns that were propped up on a single industry, then buried under its collapse. He didn't know what business Ironwood had been built upon, and it didn't matter. Paper mills, coal mines, or manufacturing plants. Once that staple industry dried up, the story always ended the same. The map on Ian's phone showed that he was still about a mile from St. Teresa's. Maybe the area around the church wasn't so dead. He had driven out of his way to make this show, and he was going to be pissed if no one was there. Then again, the promoter promised him 400 bucks just for showing up. What did it matter to him if he played for an empty room? 
Four hundred dollars? It seemed too good to be true. Ian rarely made that much money from a single performance, especially since he had gone solo. There wasn't a whole lot of money in punk rock. Most of the time, he made just enough for gas to the next show and a few days of food and beer. In the days following the breakup of Negative Space, Ian had considered trying to reinvent himself. He started writing new songs, more mature and complex tunes, but still with a strong hook. They were good songs, marketable even. All the a r people had heard them said as much, but they all agreed that Ian was not marketable. A series of physical deformities meant that he was too ugly to be anything but a punk rocker, or maybe the front man for a gothy industrial act. His eyes were too far apart and completely black, as if the pupils had ruptured and leaked the ink across the iris and sclera. The tips of his knees and elbows were too pointy and over-prominent. His chin and nose were too angular, his face too gaunt and narrow. A few labels had offered to buy the new songs from him, but he turned them down. The thought of losing ownership of his music made him queasy. He imagined some pseudo-deep corporate rock guitarist playing his melodies and sexpot Disney Channel alumni singing his lyrics. Whatever money a label might pay for his songs, it wasn't enough. The light stayed red and Ian wondered if it was broken. Confident that no cruisers were hiding in the shadows and sick of waiting at an empty intersection, he drove through the light. Two blocks up, his GPS instructed him to take a left onto Kerrigan Avenue, where the vacant colonials with sagging vinyl siding gave way to long strips of crumbling row houses. Ian slowed down as he approached another intersection, though he intended to treat the red light as a stop sign. Something stirred in his peripheral vision. He held down the brake and glanced over. A twig of a man in ill-fitting clothes watched him from the open doorway of one of the row houses. The details of the man's face were lost beneath the shadows of a hood, but long stick-like arms shot out from the two short sleeves of a voluminous sweatshirt. The guy was too tall and thin for his jeans, which were bound around his waist with a piece of rope. Smack or meth, Ian found himself wondering. His money was on meth. The man was fidgety, his movements quick and erratic. An eerie feeling, like that static electricity vibe of being watched, caused the hairs on the back of Ian's neck to stand as he blew the light and continued down Kerrigan Avenue. In his side mirror, he could see the guy watching him. Then again, there wasn't much else to watch out here, so who could blame him? Turning off of Kerrigan Avenue, Ian could now see St. Teresa's off in the distance. It was a plain church by Roman Catholic standards, a whitewashed facade dotted with stained glass windows that stretched toward the roof. Still, the light gleaming from its open doors seemed almost supernatural next to the miles of darkened windows. The steeple stretched high above the boarded up shops and condemned restaurants that made up the rest of the defunct downtown area. Ian spotted a few more meth heads as he drove toward the church. One twitched on the ground at the mouth of an alley, the brim of a soiled Minnesota twins cap covering his face. Another smoked a cigarette while pacing between the husks of wrecked cars in a gravel parking lot. Ian began to worry about his van. The vehicle was his whole life. It's where he lived and slept. It got him from gig to gig. It held all his gear, his merch, and his few meager belongings. The last thing he needed was some tweaker smashing the window or prying off his rims. He parked right outside the church and patted his front pocket, feeling for his switchblade. He knew it was there. It always was. But it was a nervous tick of his to double-check on the knife whenever he felt unsafe. He hoped he wouldn't have to use it. But he'd have no issue stabbing some meth head if it came to that. Three crust punks, two dudes and a chick, sat on the steps of the church, passing the joint back and forth. They all wore the same uniform of nonconformity, asymmetrical haircuts interspersed with dreadlocks, 
black denim vests covered in silkscreen band patches, face piercings, and prison-quality tattoos. Ian watched the group from his van. He studied their faces, and at least two of them were moderately attractive beneath the rebel facade and the layers of grime. They went out of their way to make themselves ugly, to make themselves outcasts, but they were just tourists. All it would take for them to rejoin society was a shower and a haircut. They had no idea what it meant to be forced to the fringes of society. The crust punks looked up as Ian stepped out of the van. One of the guys nodded in his direction. The girl arched her back and pushed out her tits. She made an effort not to let her eyes linger on him, playing like she either didn't recognize him or didn't care who he was. It was an annoying bit of theater that always seemed to work on the other band guys, but Ian had no interest in chicks or sex, and even less interest in head games. Ian fucking abyss! The other dude shouted. Ian waved at them as he retrieved his guitar case from the back of the van. He locked the doors and made his way to the stairs of the church. Thanks for coming out, he said, stopping to shake hands with each of them. The girl, still faint and aloof, offered him a hit from their joint. He took it, inhaled deeply, and held the smoke in his lungs. It had a strange taste, a subtle chemical compliment. Man, I saw you on your last negative space tour just outside Cleveland, the most openly excited of the group said. Hey, it was my first punk show. Fucking changed my life. A twinge of guilt ran up Ian's spine at the words. He looked at the story of hard living etched across the young man's face, the track marks on his arms, the scars from street fights and DIY piercings. He found himself wondering what the lives of these people would be like if they had never heard of him, if he hadn't turned his own misery into a musical pathogen. Would they still be with their mothers and fathers, however imperfect those families might be? Would they be happier with a shitty nine-to-five and an apartment full of consumerist refuse? Ian shrugged off the train of thought and pushed the smoke out from his lungs. He handed the joint back to the girl, now noticing speckles of emerald in the glowing orange tip. Is it laced? Maybe. The girl shrugged. We got it from the chicken side. The one who put the show together. Ian nodded and continued up the stairs. St. Teresa's was sparsely decorated, aside from architectural design elements like stained glass windows and cherubs carved into the molding. The pews had been neatly pushed to one side or the other, leaving a huge open space. On the wall above the altar was the ghost of a massive cross, a T-shaped space where the paint was a bit less faded. A girl was fumbling with the wires of a PA system set up in front of the dust-covered altar. She wore sunglasses with massive lenses, and a shock of thick green hair framed a narrow face and angular features. Presumably, this was Tia, the girl who had booked the show. Ian cleared his throat, and she turned toward him. You must be Tia. Fucking A! She squealed, ignoring his question. Tia rushed toward him, the clomp of her boots echoing throughout the church. Ian offered his hand to her, but she pushed it away and pressed her body against his. Gazing up at his face, she caressed his cheeks. If the girl outside had been trying to play it cool, Tia was the polar opposite. You look just like your pictures. Tia ran fingertips along his sharp jawline, up his cheeks and to the bony ridges of his deformed eye socket. No one had ever looked at him with such an expression before. Most people took great effort not to look at him at all. No, you're not like your pictures. She corrected herself. You're even more beautiful. Tia kissed him, gently biting his lip and giving it a playful tug. Mm. Her body felt good against his. He wanted to kiss her back. He wanted to pull her closer. This was something new for him. Sure, he'd experimented with a few girls, as well as with a few guys, but he had never enjoyed it. He simply had never been attracted to other people. But this girl, she felt different. Maybe it was her smell or the timbre of her voice. 
Maybe it was the compliments she had thrown his way. Whoa, Ian said, reluctantly pushing her away. Between her makeup and her clothes, he couldn't be sure how young she was, but he knew she was too young. How old are you exactly? Do you give a shit? She asked with a tilt of her head. That's not very punk rock. She was right. He didn't care how old she was. Not really. Neither laws nor rules mattered much to Ian. Tia kissed him again, and this time he let it happen. He returned her affections, grabbing her by the hips and kissing her back. She pushed against him, grinding herself against his growing erection. Tia! Ian pushed Tia away and turned toward the voice. A man in the black vestments of a priest stood by an open door toward the back of the church. He wore dark glasses and carried a white cane. I... I... Um... Ian scrambled for some excuse for being caught making out with a potentially underage girl until it hit him that the priest was blind. I, I'm Ian. Nice to meet you. The priest began walking toward Ian's voice, waving his cane back and forth to find his way. Ian rushed forward to meet him. He placed one hand on the priest's shoulder and took his hand with the other. <sighs> Father Lucas... And the pleasure is all mine. I'm guessing this is your place. Thanks for letting me play here. Ian was always exceptionally polite with the people in control of venues. He had learned early on that playing up the I'm punk rock fuck you attitude was not conducive to getting shows. Thank you for coming. I'm sorry for the state of things. Attendance isn't what it used to be and the church decommissioned us. So it's kind of a DIY congregation now. I can appreciate that, Ian replied. The priest placed his hand on Ian's shoulder and seemed to look him right in the eyes. His expression was earnest for a few moments and then a smile crept over his face. The strangeness of a blind man holding his gaze creeped Ian out in a way he couldn't fully understand. You should grab the rest of your gear, Tia said, taking Ian by the hand and pulling him away from Father Lucas. He nodded in agreement and excused himself. Ian loaded his gear into the church. Aside from the beat-up Gibson SG he'd been touring with for 15 years, there was just a Marshall half stack, a few pedals, and a box of merchandise. It had been more complicated back in the negative space days when he'd been touring with a full band. Setup was simpler now that it was just him. Tia stood nearby as Ian ran the wires between his amp and pedals. She stared at him with unapologetic admiration. Ian found it almost unnerving. He wasn't used to that manner of attention. Who else is playing? He asked, trying to defuse the awkwardness. It was supposed to be Surfhurst and the Vengeful and Godless. They both bailed at the last minute. It's hard to get people to play shows in Ironwood. There's not a lot going on here. I'm guessing you didn't offer them the same money you offered me. Tia smirked and pulled out a chrome cigarette case from her pocket. She retrieved the joint from the case and patted her pocket looking for a lighter. Ian retrieved the Zippo from his jacket and flicked the wheel. Tia smiled and leaned over the flame. Tiny dots of emerald glowed within the orange ember at the tip of the joint. The colors grew more intense as she sucked in the smoke. Ian wondered again what the weed was laced with. Familiar music swelled outside the church, accented by excited howls and loud engines. Tia's smirk faded and she shot an angry glance toward Father Lucas before turning her attention to the open doors. Sounds like we might have more than three people show up, Ian said. Seems like. The words fell flat and lifeless from her lips. Tia sucked on the joint, causing the tip to glow hotter, burning orange mottled with kryptonite green. She held the smoke in and pressed her lips against Ian's. He opened his lips, letting her shotgun the smoke into his mouth. She pulled away and headed for the front door. Ian's head swam as he hooked his phone to the mixing board and tuned his guitar. 
Whatever was in the weed was hitting him hard and fast. The lights on his tuner glared like shifting starbursts. They exploded and wavered every time he hit a string. Finally, he closed his eyes and brought the bridge up to his ear. Plucking two strings at a time, he listened for dissonance between notes and adjusted the machine heads until it was resolved. More people filed in as he and finished setting up. The crust punks from the stairs were followed in by a couple of odd metal guys and a group of high school kids in baseball caps and mall punk shirts. Ian could hear the crust punks making jokes at the expense of the high schoolers. The kids carried on their own conversation, pretending not to hear the jabs. Ian looked up, a slight feeling of vertigo gripping him. Tia was walking back into the church. Several of the local meth heads followed in behind her, their cowed faces covered by greasy hair or shrouded by hoods and hats. Their lanky bodies looked even stranger in the light of the church. Their proportions were off and they walked with jerky movements. Ian shook his head trying to gain control of his paranoid thoughts. It had to be the drugs he had smoked. They were screwing with his perception and making him nervous. Tia closed the door to the church and Ian could see her fiddling with something, though he couldn't tell what she was doing. The meth head slumped against the back wall of the church as Tia strode down the center of the chapel. You ready? Ian nodded. Tia smiled and turned toward the small crowd. She tapped the mic, eliciting a pop and a wave of feedback. Hold on to your cocks, motherfuckers. Let's hear it for Ian fucking abyss. Ian smirked at the animated introduction as he hit play on the drum track on his phone. The recorded sound of drumsticks clicking together played over the speaker, and Ian broke into a series of manic downstrokes as the drum track kicked in. The song he played was a stripped-down version of Orphan, from Negative Space's self-titled debut EP. It was their first hit, as far as you can apply the term hit to an underground punk band. The crowd was already hollering at slamming into each other. They were into it, even without fungus on bass to fill up the low end and without Luna's manic stage presence behind the kit. Ian was sick of playing Orphan. He had only been 15 when he wrote the song and he composed much better music since then. Still, he screamed the words into the mic with as much vitriol as he had the first time he sang them. One of the crust punks was inches away from him, screaming the lyrics in unison. Ian wondered if the guy could honestly relate to the song, or if he just thought it sounded cool. Was he the real deal? A gutter punk with no way off the street? Or could he go home to his parents in Connecticut or LA or where the fuck ever when he got bored of playing squatter? Ian's dizziness worsened. The floor seemed to shift beneath him and the rowdy crowd looked like they were spinning in the narrowing tunnel of his vision. It reminded him of the shifting tubular passageways in a carnival funhouse. He closed his eyes, hoping the disorientation would fade. Ian could feel his knees buckling. He wheeled himself not to fall and focused on the rhythm of the pre-recorded drums and the feeling of the strings beneath his fingers. He ran his pick down the low E, then let a diminished D chord ring out. A feeling of nausea welled up in his stomach. He tried to fight it giving himself to the music, letting his consciousness dissolve into the sound, just as he always did when he was hurting. Place, 
He screeched the lines of the chorus. And up and screaming at the stars, cursing the world for a shitty chance. <clears throat> Something hit Ian's guitar, knocking him backward and screwing up the song. He fell on his ass and the guitar let out a squeal of feedback. Ian opened his eyes and tried to keep the church from spinning for long enough to make sense of what had happened. The crust punk who had been singing along with him was seizing on the floor. His two friends stared at him with dazed expressions. It looked to Ian like they were unsteady on their feet, but then again the whole church seemed a bit shaky. The rest of the crowd gathered around Ian and the seizing crust punk. Some gawked and pulled out their phones to document the scene. Others yelled for someone to call 911. One of the high school kids pushed his way through the crowd, shouting that he knew CPR. As he knelt beside the older punk who had been teasing him earlier, the female Krusty collapsed. Her head hit the marble floor with a thud. The last of the trio staggered to his knees to check on the girl. He mothered something about blood, then his body went limp on top of her. Ian looked toward Tia who stood calmly to the side. The locals and the priest were grouped together behind her. She raised her arm above her head and brought it down in a sweeping arc. The emaciated creatures behind her lunged into the small crowd of Ian's fans. They skittered on all fours, their movements inhuman and their speed incredible. Ian watched in horror as one of the seemingly demonic wretches tackled a high school kid and bit chunks of meat from his neck and face. Another grasped one of the aged metal guys by the waist and burrowed into his stomach with gnashing teeth. A few of Ian's fans managed to avoid their insane attackers and rush for the exit. The door of the church shook and clattered as they tugged and pushed, but it never gave. Tia strode through the carnage, her stride cool and confident. She took off her sunglasses, and Ian shuddered as she stared at him with bulbous jet black eyes, eyes just like his own. An exclamation of fear traveled from his brain to his lips, but it drizzled out of his mouth like a drunken whisper. Tia pressed her bony finger to his lips, hushing him. Don't worry about those posers, Ian. They'll never understand us. Tia took another hit from her joint. He instead transfixed by emerald specks that glowed at its burning tip. She leaned over and pressed her lips against his and exhaled the smoke into his mouth again. He tried to back away but found himself too weak to crawl or even to keep his eyes open. Ian's head pounded in rhythm with a chorus of croaks. The noise reminded him of crickets or swamp toads, but amplified through movie theater surround sound. A single voice sang an ugly melody beneath the rhythm. Oh, praise the witch of Ironwood, the daughter of Nop, who lay with flame. The meter of the singing was awkward. The words fit ill in the space. It reminded Ian of psalms he had been forced to sing at one of the group homes he had lived in as a kid. Bony hands clutched his arms and his boots scraped against the ground as he was dragged along. His eyelids were too heavy to open and his mouth too dry to form words of protest. The croaking grew louder as he was dragged further along, as did the song of prayer. All praise the mistress of the end, she who birthed death itself. Ian moved his tongue around, hoping to coax some moisture into his mouth. A tiny bit of spit formed. His body was beginning to respond to his commands. It was a struggle, but he managed to open his eyes now. He found himself being dragged through a massive basement with rough concrete walls and an earthen floor. The walls were decorated in angular runes and knotwork monsters, rust-red sigils and beasts painted upon hard gray backdrops. 
The locals, the men he mistook for meth heads, were gathered here. All but a few stood still as death, save for pulsating bulges at their throats. He shuddered upon seeing them, unshrouded by hats or hoods. Each of them possessed the same deformities as he. Some were more pronounced, some less. Regardless of how exaggerated their unusual features were, each of the men, they all appeared to be males save for Tia, had the same black insectoid eyes and gaunt limbs. Tia stood at the back of the room. Dim light from bare bulbs in the ceiling illuminated her naked form. Her knees and elbows met at sharp points, the bones threatening to break through her skin. The space between her breasts was marked with a series of horizontal ridges. Her waist was waist thin, a narrow dividing line between her upper and lower segments. Without her sunglasses, Ian could see the bony ridges around her obsidian eyes. He had never known such beauty could exist. Several of Ironwood's emaciated men rubbed her down with dark oil. Father Lucas, who had dispensed with his ruse of blindness, waved the smoking censer around her. The embers inside the censer gave off the same emerald radiance as the laced marijuana had. Praise the mother of monsters, who loves all of her terrible children, the priest sang. The two men holding the end came to a stop. They forced him to his knees and held his arms tight in their grips. He wondered how they were so strong given their slight physiques. Then again, he was stronger than he looked as well. Appearances could be deceiving. The rhythmic croaking stopped all at once. All eyes were on Tia, and hers were on Ian. Her skin glistened beneath the haze of incense, her visage like that of a terrible goddess. She took a step toward Ian, and his heart stuttered. Dread Engbroda, hear our prayers, the priest shouted, no longer singing. Bless our sister Tia, so she may birth a hundred young. Place the crown of our race upon her brow. Let him free, Tia commanded. Ian Abyss is not a prisoner. He is our guest. He is our salvation. The two men released their hold on Ian and he slumped over without their support. Tia knelt beside him and cupped his face in her hands. She locked his gaze, and he could almost feel the gravity of her black hole eyes sucking him in. A tear streamed down Tia's face. You're crying. You're just... She whispered. You're just so beautiful. Her words mirrored his own sentiments towards her. Tia was the most incredible creature he had ever laid eyes upon. Ian wiped a tear from her face. Tia kissed him on the lips. She gripped Ian's shirt at the bottom seam and lifted it over his head. She pushed him onto the dirt floor where she unbuckled his belt and pulled his pants down around his thighs. Ian didn't resist as she climbed on top of him and lowered herself onto his erection. The strange congregation formed a circle around Ian and Tia as they made love in the dirt. The priest muttered soft prayers as he watched. Ian was so caught up in the ecstasy of the moment that he was barely unnerved by the cultish audience. I have waited so long for you. We have waited so long. Ian watched her, finding such profound beauty in her writhing form that it made even his favorite music seem mundane in comparison. What was the wailing anger of Earth AD, or the dark, sovereign spirituality of Sonic Mass, compared to the vision and the touch of the woman atop him? Ian grasped Tina's hips as he approached Climax. He held on to her tightly as if their connection tethered him to existence, as if his whole life had been leading up to this moment. Euphoric chemicals exploded in Ian's brain as he climaxed. He lay on his back, his eyes closed, 
drowning in a sea of oxytocin. It was the best feeling he had ever known. Better than booze. Better than playing music. Better than the few times he had shot dope. Tia collapsed on top of him. Her breast pushed against his chest and the bony ridges between dug into his sternum. He moved his hand up from her hips and wrapped his arms around her. This was everything he had been missing his whole life. This was home. A sharp burst of pain shot through Ian's collarbone. He screamed and opened his eyes. Tia's face was pressed into his neck, her head moving back and forth in tight jerking motions. It took him several long seconds to process what was happening. She was biting him, tearing bits of flesh away with her teeth. He emballed his right hand into a fist and punched Tia in the ribs. She flinched at the blow and a guttural noise bellowed up from her chest. Ian swung again, hitting her in the same spot. This time she pulled her face away from his neck and smiled at him through a crimson veil. Something was happening to Tia's face beneath the wash of blood. Her jaw pulsed as if the bone had split down the middle and was trying to break free from the skin that bound it. Ian moved to punch her again, but Tia gripped his face with both hands and slammed his skull into the dirt. Not once, but several times in succession. He looked up at her through the haze of pain and the retreating fog of inebriation. Her eyes were full of love and lust. Tia smiled wider and wider until the skin in her jaw tore apart and her lower jaw split into two bony mandibles. Blood drizzled from her raggedy bisected lip, landing on his chest, warm and wet. She rapidly clicked her mandibles together, like the machine gun fire snare drum from one of his songs. The gathered men of Ironwood responded, joining together in a chorus of maddening croaks. He and thrashed and screamed beneath Tia as Father Lucas shouted out prayers and invocations that were surely not directed to the Christian God or his saints. She parted her mandibles and lunged down on Ian. He struck her in the throat before she could bite into him. She reeled back gasping. A slimy crimson mist sprayed from her split jawbone as she struggled for air. He impressed his advantage, sitting up and shoving Tia off him. <clears throat> Scooting away from her, he drew his legs in tight and retrieved the knife from his pocket. The blade trembled in his hand. Father Lucas knelt beside Tia, stroking her and whispering soothing words. Tia's wheezing slowed, her breath normalizing. The priest's gaze shot up to Ian and his expression went ice cold. <sighs> How dare you? How dare you lay a hand upon her? Ian clumsily pulled his pants up and got to his feet. <clears throat> he spewed a string of curses as he waved the blade back and forth, hoping to ward off the men surrounding them. None of them had any reaction. They stood still and dispassionate, machines waiting to be turned on. Tia sat up and nudged the priest away. Her tongue darted out, licking blood from one mandible then the next. It was longer than it had been when they kissed, and thicker, a wet, ropey muscle. Panicked by the sight of Tia's metamorphosis, Ian scanned the area for a means of escape. At the far end of the basement was an unlit passageway, a brick arch framing other darkness. Ian gave Tia and Father Lucas a wide berth and ran forward. Tia screeched and one of the men stepped in front of Ian, blocking his path. Without a second thought, Ian plunged his knife into the man's stomach and shoved him aside. The blade slipped out, red and slick. His heart thundering in his chest, Ian ran for the passageway. He didn't turn around to see if the mad locals pursued him but he could hear their rapid footfalls behind them. He lunged forward, succumbing to suppressed instincts, and his hands slammed against the earth. Suddenly, he was running on all fours, his pace exponentially faster. 
The act brought back flashes of forgotten memory. Caregivers and foster parents yelling at him to walk like a human being and none speculating that he was possessed. A hand grasped Ian's ankle and pulled him back. He kicked with the other foot, the sole of his boot smashing into the face of his pursuer. The hand let go and Ian skittered across the ground and through the brick archway. Ian careened through the darkness, brittle debris breaking beneath his boots and his palms. His foot caught on something unseen, a root growing out from the earthen floor perhaps, or a rock jutting up from the dirt. He stumbled headlong. In a bid to maintain balance, he flailed his arms and grasped blindly. His hand found purchase on something in the dark, and he was able to control his fall to a certain extent. His knees still hit the earth hard, but at least his face was spared. The object Ian caught himself on was roughly half his height. He ran his hand against it, wishing he could see. The thing felt like a cluster of orbs, each smooth and rounded, but the texture was interrupted by jagged lines like cracks in leather. Ian knelt on stinging knees, half expecting the stampede of maniacs to descend upon him while he caught his breath. In that moment, he realized that the terrible sound of their nightmarish locomotion had ceased. The drone of their croaking, or whatever the hell you might call the noise they made, still echoed through the darkness, but they hadn't followed him beyond the brick threshold. In the space between the rhythmic croaks, he and heard footfalls so soft they might have been in his head. It was Tia. It had to be. Tia, naked and monstrous stalking him in the darkness. Ian reached up and grasped onto the cluster of orbs. He gripped a rounded surface and tried to pull himself up, but his fingertips ruptured the orb. A watery substance rushed out, followed by a more viscous sludge that reeked of sulfur. An involuntary utterance of disgust shot from Ian's lips as he pulled his hand back and shook the slime from it. He wiped his fingers in the dirt and pushed himself to his feet, not seeking support this time. Ian reached into the pocket of his jacket and grabbed a zippo. He flicked open the cap and rolled his thumb across the flint wheel. The small flame didn't give much light, but Ian had always had excellent night vision. He never needed much light. The cluster of orbs stood before him, visible in the glow from the lighter. Ian studied the yellow slime that oozed from the ruptured orb like liquid sunshine, and bowel rose in his throat. It was an egg. He was standing before a mound of huge leathery eggs. It's okay, Tia called from beyond the reach of the Zippo's modest radiance. Those aren't viable. None of them are. Ian stepped around the clustered eggs and shined his lighter back and forth. The lighter fell upon mound after mound of leathery orbs. He swallowed hard and moved away from Tia's voice, careful not to stumble into any of the clusters. That's why we need you, Ian. There's something wrong with our bloodline. Maybe there's too much inbreeding. Or maybe it's just the opposite. Perhaps we've tainted ourselves with too much human blood. That's what Father Lucas believes. Ian picked up his pace, desperate to find an exit before Tia caught up to him and finished what she'd begun. The mounds of eggs became more densely placed the further he moved. Some were already broken. Lines of white and yellow crust dried upon their leathery surface. Others were deflated and desiccated. Whatever the root of the problem, our males had lost the vitality to fertilize new young. The life from Ian Zippo fell upon a waist-high wall of eggs that stretched out into the darkness on either side. There was nowhere else to go. He grimaced, pushing through the mass. Sulfurous yolks soaked into his clothes and bits of leathery husk clung to him. The slimy feeling on his skin was nearly as sickening as the stench of rot and death that hissed out from each ruptured orb. Ian held his arm out, hoping that his flame might fall upon an egress. Instead, he found a monster. 
There was no other word for it. None that he knew, at least. I think the stress of that, the tragedy of staring at all this unrealized potential, that's what killed our mother. The creature was perched on the wooden days that was engraved with interlaced runes and knotwork monsters. It rested on a segmented coil of countless insectoid legs. From that sinuous lower half sprung the body of a woman with gray, brittle skin. The texture of a wasp's nest. Her stomach looked like it had once been distended, but now lay sunken in and bony ridges shone between her shriveled breasts. Ian stared into the monster's face, framed by long locks of brittle white hair. His lifeless eyes were as black and as wide as his own, but she had so many of them. Four sets going down her long face. Serrated mandibles sat where her jaw should have been, the same kind of terrible maw that he had seen Tia's mouth morph into. Ian's mind was flooded with a series of unmoored emotions, sadness and homesickness, nostalgia and yearning, love and fear. I knew there had to be others like us out there. Ian jumped as Tia's hand grazed his shoulder. <clears throat> Other hives, hidden among the children of Vasker and Imbla. This isn't real. Ian shook his head and backed away from Tia. That's some sort of fucked up taxidermy idol. And what about me, Ian? He considered Tia with her bisected and serrated jaw. The zippo flame reflected in her eyes, a wavering flicker of amber against the backdrop of a city, and she was terrible. She was beautiful. She was inhuman. For this, he had no answer. We need to finish what we started. I need you inside me, fully and completely, so that I might sit as the new queen. Don't you want to be inside me, Ian? Tia asked, stroking his cheek. Part of him wanted that. He wanted to be consumed by her in every way. In her eyes and touch, he felt the home he had never found elsewhere. Tia gripped Ian by the hair. She spread her mandibles and pulled him toward her. Oily, viscous fluid ran from her mouth and Ian found it sexy. The way one might yearn for the glistening mouth of a seductress. The hormonal spell broke as Tia's pincers bit into Ian's face. Ian flinched and squirmed at the pain elicited from Tia's bite. He tried to break away, but her mandibles tore at his cheeks and scraped at the bone beneath. The pain from the lacerations was terrible, but worse was the crushing pressure threatening to cave in his cheekbones. The zippo fell from Ian's slackened grip. A dull thud echoed through the chamber as the ladder hit the dirt floor. The flame stayed lit and caught the debris on the ground, spreading from the lighter to the husks of the dead dried eggs. Tia's grasp loosened. She backed away from the flame and Ian fell to the earth among the burning debris. Ancient curses dripped from her tongue and her mandibles clicked together. She screamed, watching as the fire spread throughout the chamber and licked at the rune-laden days where the dead and terrible queen sat enthroned. Her voice regressed into desperate croaking and the gangly men of Ironwood poured into the chamber. Father Lucas was the first among them. He scanned the room, awed and appalled. Whispered prayers fell from his lips as he made complex somatic gestures. Tia motioned and clicked, speaking in some language that defied human speech. The men responded to her commands and rushed toward the fire. Some stripped off their jackets and shirts to smother the flames. Others tried to extinguish the fire by throwing themselves upon it. It didn't matter. The blaze spread faster than they could combat it. He embatted flames from his jeans and hopped to his feet. He ran back the way he'd come, giving Tia and her people as wide a berth as he could manage. None of them even glanced his way. 
The room on the other side of the archway was empty now, save for the discarded effigy of Christ, who peeked out with one eye from under a yellow tarp. Ian looked back through the passageway at the panicked monsters battling the growing inferno. Nausea set upon him as he tried to make sense of the current surrealness, the inhuman cult and their ghastly burning queen. Fighting to keep his stomach from flipping, Ian stumbled toward the basement stairs but stopped as he noticed the water heater tucked against the wall. His eyes fell upon the black iron gas line that fueled the water heater. His body was already trembling with adrenaline and it only took a few strong kicks before gas began to hiss from one of the damaged joints. As the smell of gas reached Ian's nose, he ran upstairs and emerged in the church's sacristy. No Christian symbol decorated the room. No Bibles or scholarly religious texts lined the shelves, but rather aged leather tomes with faded angular writing on the spines. Most disturbing were the pictures of him, clippings from magazines and printouts from punk rock websites. These were pinned to a corkboard and someone had scrawled notes in red ink across each photo. Some of the writing was decipherable, written in Latin script, albeit in a tongue that Ian didn't speak. The normal writing was interspersed with occult nonsense, Nordic runes, astrological symbols, and alchemical formulae. Ian only spent a few seconds staring at the surreal killer as shrine to him. He didn't need to understand this place or these people. He just needed to escape. The door of the sacristy opened into the chapel, which was littered with human offal. A few corpses lay eviscerated beside his amplifier, which still hummed with feedback. Others had fallen into bloody heaps by the heavy front door. Ian's fans glared at him with dead eyes wherever they lay. Ian unplugged his SG and let the cable fall into a pool of blood. The amp let out a static hiss as he stumbled away, avoiding the corpses strewn across the floor. Guitar in hand, he ran for the front door. Ian remembered Tia messing with it before commanding her lunatic army to attack. She had locked him in. He rattled the door, desperate to escape before the place blew up or the cultist came clamoring after him, but it wouldn't budge. Cursing and trembling, Ian scanned the chapel for some other exit, and his eyes fell upon the tall stained glass windows that ran the height of the walls on either side. He approached one of the windows. It was a mural of Adam and Eve. At their feet lay what must have been a serpent, but its body was segmented and it looked more like a millipede than a snake. Another figure lurked in the background of the mural. Delicate channels of lead formed angular tattoos across her glassy ice-white skin. Her eyes were cut from obsidian rather than translucent glass. The figure had to be an angel. That was the only thing that made sense. A grim medieval seraphim holding judgment over Adam and Eve. Even so, that didn't seem quite right to Ian. This woman in the background, even rendered in stained glass, seemed much older, wiser, and far more terrible than any angel dreamed of by man. Ian gripped the neck of his SG with both hands and swung the guitar into the window. Ah! Dramatic shards of glass rained down like bits of crumbling rainbow. Lead channels bent and broke beneath the force of the blow. The mural was ruined. The window now looked like a gaping mouth with sharp and wicked teeth. Ian swung the guitar back and forth, clearing away jagged glass and bobs of lead. He tossed the guitar outside, then laid his jacket over the window frame to protect himself from the remaining bits of glass and metal. A loud croaking echoed through the chapel, over the hiss of Ian's amplifier. Father Lucas stumbled out from the sacristy. A revolver hung loose in his grip. His neck bulged in rhythm with the animalistic sound he uttered. Scarlet spittle leaked from his mouth with each croak. The priest raised the gun with an unsteady hand and fired at Ian, but the shot went wide. Ian flung himself out through the shattered window. 
He landed on his back and the wind was knocked out of him. A string of vulgarities formed in his mind between each gasp as he tried to catch his breath. Ian got up despite the breathless sensation in his chest. He left his jacket and guitar behind and ran from the church as fast as he could. Once again, instinct urged him to lurch forward and his palm slammed down against the dead lawn. He raced away from the church on all fours, more like a beast than a man. Gunshots echoed into the night. Father Lucas cried out guttural exclamations between each shot. Venom dripped from every harsh syllable. Ian didn't look back. He prayed to whatever gods or spirits might be listening that Father Lucas would keep missing him, and he scrambled for his van. Crouched low, Ian reached up and swung open the passenger side door. A slug grazed Ian's left shoulder as he tried to crawl into the van. He fell against the wheel well, groaning and gritting his teeth. He looked toward the church. Father Lucas stood framed by the jagged remnants of stained glass in the shattered window and drew a bead on him. Ian tried to get up and into the van, but his legs were like jelly. Tears welled up in his eyes and they shone like polished obsidian. The priest had him dead to rights. But a petite, blazing figure shoved the holy man aside before he could pull the trigger. It was Tia, her aberrant body aflame. She leapt through the broken window and galloped toward Ian on all fours, amber fire trailing behind her, and the ground left burning in her wake. Ian turned and gripped the passenger seat with a shaky hand and pulled himself up. He could hear Tia's hands and feet slapping against the ground. The sound of her sizzling skin pricked the hairs on his arms. He flung himself over the seat and shut the door behind him. Ian shimmied over to the driver's side and slid his key into the ignition. The van roared to life. He shifted into drive and peeled away from the church as fast as he dared. In his side mirror, he could see Tia gaining on him, outpacing his vehicle. The RPM gauge hovered around 2,000. Regardless of how hard he impressed his foot down on the gas pedal, the van crept up from 30 miles an hour, reluctant to accelerate. Ian swore and punched the steering wheel, eliciting a series of honks. Without warning, a sound like a hundred thunderstrikes filled the night. Safety glass splintered and spiderwebbed as the van spun out to the side. Ian gripped the wheel and tried to straighten out, but the vehicle flipped and rolled across the asphalt. Ian would only remember the following moments in blurred mental snapshots. The smell and the sound of gasoline dripping from a ruptured fuel line. The ruins of the blazing church against a lifeless black cityscape. The abrasive pain of crawling through shattered glass. Tia steel and lifeless corpse, burning in the street like a demonic effigy. Ian strummed the opening chord to Orphan for a crowd of 18 fans gathered in a basement in some dying Rust Belt town. The small crowd hollered and cheered. He barked out the first line of the song and they all sang along with him, but he knew none of them really got it. They were fair weather freaks, normal people who could go back to the vanilla world of their parents anytime they chose. He had been sick of playing orphan for a long time, but it held a renewed meaning for him ever since that night in Ironwood. It conjured images of sad and desperate creatures who looked much like him. It made him think of beautiful women with eyes that gleamed with the blackest hunger. It made him wish he had stayed and given himself to that hunger. Ian scanned each face in the crowd. He looked for familiar deformities, gaunt elongated limbs or bony ridges around the eyes, but found nothing. That was okay. There was another hive out there somewhere. Another forgotten town of monsters like himself. 
He'd play gigs in every shithole in ghost town across the world if that's what it took. Someday he'd find them, and he would be an orphan no more. And that was Orphan by Arthur Curtis M. Lawson. I tell you, back in my band days, I'd meet women like that all the time. My advice? Do what you gotta do, but get the hell out of there before they start chewing on your face. It only goes downhill from there, trust me. A little about the author. Over the past decade, Curtis M. Lawson has emerged as one of the most dynamic and vibrant voices in contemporary weird fiction. Gifted with a prose style of admirable fluency and evocativeness, Lawson also reveals a broad range in subject matter, extending from tales of science fiction to stories of psychological terror. The Envious Nothing, Lawson's latest collection, is overbrimming with tragedy and existential terror, alongside hope and the nascence of dark potential. Stories such as You and I and The Envious Nothing and A Grave at the End of the World explore cosmic horror in its most quintessential sense. Conversely, Everything Smells Like Smoke Again and The Green Man of Freetown display horror in the most intimate of relationships. Lawson is deft at innovative treatments of old age motifs. The Rhyme Mother presents a new take on Halloween. Elvis and Isolde evokes the transmigration of souls and the truth about vampires melds psychological and supernatural horror. Most impressive is an unpublished novella, Beneath the Emerald Sky, set in Iceland and summoning up hideous vistas of strangeness from myth and legend. The Envious Nothing is available on Amazon or at hippocampuspress.com. That's hippocampuspress.com. So friends, go out and get you a copy of The Envious Nothing, won't you? You won't regret it. And as long as you're feeling generous, friends, subscribe to this podcast wherever you do your listening and leave me a five-star review and a kind word if you're feeling so inclined. Even if you're listening on YouTube, I need soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and I appreciate it. And on the side note, I will say that I'm trying to do this for a living and it sure as hell would help me. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other podcast episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 a month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012 including past episodes of this program and all our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting the other guys' sponsors. When you support their sponsors, you support their shows. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook and Instagram and sometimes Twitter. Sometimes. And remember, we're accepting submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. I'm afraid this is where we part ways, friend. At least till next week. So grab a drink for the road. And wherever you're playing your next gig, stay clear of those green hairs. And bring your own weed while you're at it. I'd like to recognize a few of our YouTube crew. So, David Wellman, Rod Clark, and Johan McCormick. I'd like to thank y'all for your comments and support. It really means a lot to me. So, David Wellman, Rod Clark, and Johan McCormick, may the wind be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. And just as soon as you're done with all that, 
go fuck yourselves. <laughs> Good night, y'all. Oh, and, uh, sorry about the singing voice, y'all. That's as good as old Drew Blood can do with all the Marlboros I've smoked over the years. <laughs> Y'all come back now, you hear? Chilling tales for dark nights.